بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله نبينا محمد أما بعد إن كتاب طهارة of our book اللؤلؤ والمرجان فيما اتفق عليه الشيخان the first hadith of the chapter is hadith number 134 then hadith number 135 which we previously explained reach hadith number 136 under the seventh chapter the author he says babun fi wudu an-nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he says the chapter of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's wudu how the messenger of allah alayhi salatu wasallam made wudu a very important chapter which has several meanings the chapter heading we mean has several meanings the first is i.e. the mandatory way that the muslim must make wudu the basic bare necessities of the wudu according to the sunnah of the prophet alayhi salatu wasallam obviously this mandatory way is going to be understood and applied or applied in light of the quran al karim the verse in surah al maida in which allah azza wa jalla instructs the believers when they wish to stand they stand to the prayer they wish to pray and they are not upon tahara to wash certain things and to wipe certain things the well known verse in the quran al karim secondly is the recommended acts of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's wudu how he offered the wudu in the perfect light and the recommended manner the way that is preferable not mandatory not obligatory but preferable commendable what the muslim should do the basic simple knowledge that every muslim can obtain and learn to make this illustrious act of ibadah on a daily basis in the most perfect way possible nothing difficult nothing hard simple basic easy rudimentary knowledge that the lay muslim should learn la la the talib wal ilm and it's very scary for a student of knowledge to perform the wudu in a lazy manner always rushing not completing his wudu not perfecting his wudu not using the two stick not saying the adhkar afterwards not washing the body the body parts more than once etc it's permissible to do it just once it's not mandatory to use the two stick but a student of knowledge should not always every single time disregard the perfect or the perfect the perfected way of offering the wudu according to the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam what's the point what's the purpose of learning and studying the hadith if you're never ever going to implement them and you're always going to do that which is just mandatory <clears throat> and it lies no doubt that the general people the layman muslims they look up to the learned muslims the learned muslims are to be their role models they are to be their leaders khairan inshallah so the things that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did that were mandatory and the things that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did that were just recommended the author he says hadith of abdullah ibn zaid انه سئل عن وضوء النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فدعا بطول من ماء فتوضا لهم وضوء النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فاكفا على يده من التور فغسل يديه ثلاثا ثم ادخل يده في التور فمضمض واستنشق واستنثر بثلاث غرفات ثم ادخل يده فغسل وجهه ثلاثا ثم غسل يديه مرتين الى المرفقين ثم ادخل يده فمسح راسه فأقبل بهما وأدبر مرة واحدة ثم غسل رجليه إلى الكعبين The author he says narrated Abdullah ibn Zaid رضي الله تعالى عنه or not even narrated by him but the hadith that he narrated narrated by someone else the hadith that he is being asked he's being asked the question in this hadith So you wouldn't say this in English narrated by Abdullah bin Zaid rather the tabi'i or another sahabi whoever is the sub narrator he is the person that is actually reporting it it says that Abdullah bin Zaid radiyallahu anhu he was asked about the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's wudu how did the prophet make wudu what did he do what didn't he do so instead of verbally saying something Abdullah bin Zaid he told the people to bring him a vessel bring me a pot a tor something that comes from uh clay stone 
okay, or another type of, uh, maybe a type of metal, okay, brass or copper or something like this. He said, bring me this pot. And then when he got the pot of water, he made wudu in which the manner, or the manner in which the Prophet ﷺ made wudu. So he poured the water on his hands from the pot. Then he washed them three times. Then he put his hand inside of the pot. And he made mother mother and istin shak. He put the water in his mouth. He swished it around. He spat the water out. He put the water in his nose. He inhaled the water. He sniffed or snorted the water. Wastan thala bi thalath gharafatin. And he did this, he took the water out of his mouth, out of his nose, with three hands, uh, three handfuls of water in and out. In and out. The entire process. He put water in his mouth, water in his nose, and then he put it out three times. It's going to sound a bit funny in English. Or as it says, for mother, the mother, he put the water in his mouth. Wastan shaka. Then he sniffed the water. Wastan thala. Then he... Put, took the water out of his uh, nose, out of his mouth, obviously. He says, with three handfuls of water. So if you literally translated it, it would, wouldn't be as smooth, wouldn't make too much sense in English. He put the water in his mouth, water in his nose, then he put the water out of his nose with three handfuls. No, it's one entire process. It then says, he then put his hand and his arm in the pot, and he... Oh, his hands, he says, Yadahu, his hand here, his kef. And he washed his face three times. Then he washed his hands twice up to the elbows, which clearly means he washed his hands with his elbows or up to his elbows, yani with his forearms. He washed his arms twice. Then he put his hand back into the pot for masaha ra'sahu, and he wiped his head. In other words, he put his hand in the pot and took it out the pot, released the water, then wiped the head and not washed the head. The hadith then says, فَأَقْبَلَ بِهِمَا وَأَدْبَرَ So he went to the front and he went to the back one time. Then he washed his feet up to the ankles. Then he washed his feet up to the ankles. So the highlighting point or the main lesson from this hadith is giving us a general skeleton, a general structure, a general blueprint of the Prophet Wasallam's wudu. The general format, the general layout. And it also gives us some specifics. It gives us some meat, some flesh, some skin on the skeleton. But at least we can say we have the basic frame. And on top of the frame, there are other benefits as well. Or how the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, offered the wudu, the general way. So therefore, it will be unbefitting for any Muslim to make wudu in a manner that opposes this general manner. Does the Muslim have to do all of the specifics, all of the details? No. Is there khilaf among the ulama and wiping the head more than once? What part of the foot, how many times, so on and so forth? It's a different story. But the general structure, there's not going to be any difference of opinion among the people of knowledge. Is that you have to wash this, wash that, wash this, wipe this, and wash that. In general. Starting and ending. As far as the salah, then the same is said. There's no difference between the ulama of the Hanafi madhab and the ulama of the Shafi'i madhab. There's no difference between Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, Sufyan al-Thawri. There's no difference between any of these fuqaha with regards to the general structure of the salah. Is that one must stand, one must bow, one must sit, one must come out of sitting. No one differs on that. But they differ on some issues, some specifics, some finely tuned details. Rather, not just some, but many. And it's very important for the student of knowledge to understand. For the student of knowledge to understand. And it's also important for the layman Muslim to understand. Those who say that fiqh is difficult, it's hard, it's burdensome, it's so much khilaf, I don't know where to start. Albani says something, then Uthaymin says something. Uh, uh, the Hanafis in India and Pakistan, they pray like this, and those in Turkey, and the Malikis in North Africa, and the Zahiris in Spain, and so on and so on and so forth. We say, oftentimes, 
people, they think that the khilaf is in the foundation, and it's not. And many times, people have not mastered and perfected the foundation, the asl. As we said, the skeleton, the bone is cracked or shaky. And then they move on to other things. So none of the ulama differ on these general basic principles, the hajj. There's no ulama who say that you don't have to make tawaf, you don't have to make sa'i. There's no arafah, there's no muzdalifa. This is in general, they agree on all of these things. A hijab of a Muslim woman. There's no ulama who said that a Muslim woman can just be undressed, uncovered, mutabarrija, in the street. But they differ over hands and the face. But they don't say she can show her hair, she can show her knees, her legs, her chest. And the list goes on any other example that you wish to make. And this is an extremely important principle for the Muslim to understand, let alone the disciple of hadith. So that's the main highlighting point from this hadith. The main highlighting point from the hadith. A major benefit that we get from this hadith, or before we get into the benefits, let's go back to the sharh. The companion Abdullah bin Zayd anhu had learned and he had benefited from his teacher, Muhammad sallallahu And that is to teach through actions. To teach the people through actions. And oftentimes, teaching someone physically with actions is stronger, is louder, is much more bold than doing it through statement. So he told them to bring him a pot of water, and then he washed his hands outside of the pot, not inside of the pot. And some of the people of knowledge, they say, washing the hands before wudu is not from the actual structure of the wudu. It's not mandatory. It's not something that you must do in the wudu, but it's something that's recommended before the wudu, to wash one's hands three times, or at least once. And some may say, that it's only recommended to wash the hands three times when a person is making wudu from a pot, from a vessel, a bowl, before he puts his hands inside of the bowl. As far as if the water is being poured on him, then it's not necessarily recommended, some of them they may say this, to pour the water on the hands. And that's a long issue in itself. So he did this, it says, thalathan, three times. In other words, thalathan, thalathan, three, three. In other words, six times. Or three times altogether, but it's two hands, two times three, it's one of me, six. So therefore, um, he then put his hand into the pot. In other words, after he washed his hands outside of the pot, as we just explained, the wisdom behind that. He put his hand back inside of the pot after his hands were clean. It then says, the mother. He did that which is called al mother. He put the water in his mouth. He swished it around his mouth, okay? Not necessarily gargled the water, but at least he swished it around. And some may say even a light gargling. Wastan shaka. And then he inhaled the water. He put the water in his nose. Other hadith tell us, or explain to us, the recommended way of doing this, doing it vigorously. Wastan thara. Then he extracted the water, poured out the water, blew out the water, Spat out the water. Bithalath gharafat. And he did this with three handfuls. In other words, three handfuls. Three times. One, two, three. As far as is it permissible to use half a handful for the mouth, half for the nose, so on and so forth. Those are other details. It then says, Then he put his hand back into the pot. And he washed his face three times. He washed his face three times. It doesn't say yadayhi, it doesn't say his hands, it says his hand. And in the Arabic language, it can mean both, because it's mudaf. It could be his hand, or it can mean his yaday, his hands, yadayhi. Whereas he washed his face, and some of the people of knowledge, they say that the Muslim has the option of washing the face with one hand, or he can wash the face with two hands. And some of them say that it's best and easier to do two hands, or you do with two hands. And others, they also say, is that the person should wash the face starting from the hairline, the beginning, the forehead, on down, and not from the chin on up. Tayyip, khayran, insha'Allah. It then says, ثُمَّ غَسَلَ يَدَيْهِ مَرَّتَيْنِ إِلَى الْمِرْفَقِينَ Then he washed his yadain twice. And he washed his yadain to the mirfaqain. Plural of mirfaq, meaning the elbow. So this clearly proves that he washed from the tips of his fingers to his elbow, along with the forearm, 
and he did not just wash the forearm without the hands, nor the hands and the tips of his elbows, but all one. And the word yed in the Arabic language has several meanings, several meanings. And from the word yed, from the meanings, from the fingertip to the elbow, from the fingertip to the bicep, from the fingertip to the shoulder to one's armpit. This is all, or all of these things are included in the word yed. And sometimes the word yed just means kef, fingertips to the wrist. And there are other meanings of the word yed in the Arabic language, which are well known to the people of knowledge. So therefore, this hadith shows us is that the Prophet, والسلام, he washed this part of his body. Now, many people, they make the mistake when they wash their arms, they leave out their hands. And they say, we leave out the hands, we don't wash the hands because we wash the hands in the beginning of the wudu. So it's no need to wash them again. And this is a monstrous mistake. Whereas washing the hands in the beginning of the wudu was what? We said that that is a recommended act. And some of the ulama say only recommended in the time of using an actual pot, a vessel. Most Muslims today, Allahu alam, if we can say that, many Muslims today, we can definitely say this in modern Western countries, or even Eastern countries, or Middle Eastern countries, in which there's running water. Many Muslims today, they make wudu from a faucet, from something that is poured, from something that is poured, and not from an actual pot. There are some people that do make wudu like this, some people make ghusl like this, with a pot, with a bowl, all right? But many people, if not most, they use it from a faucet. So therefore, you're not even required to wash your hands three times in the beginning of wudu. But you are required to wash your hands with your arms, as is mentioned here. So we have to be careful. And the Prophet I mean, clearly tells us those whom Allah wants good for, he gives them fiqh of the deen. Moving forward. It then says, ثُمَّ He then put his hand or hands in the pot and he wiped his head. In other words, he took him out of the pot, as we explained. And then he wiped his head. It doesn't say that he washed his head. It doesn't say that he scrubbed his head. It says that he wiped it. He made masah. He says, فَأَقْبَلَ بِهِمَا وَأَدْبَرَ And then he did two things. One, he did iqbal. And second, he did idbar. The word iqbal literally means to go to the front. To go to the front. And the word idbar literally means to go to the dubr, to the back. Uh, we've explained this in our lessons on Bulugh al-Maram. What this actually means and the khilaf of the ulama regarding these words. So one way of doing it is, it says, فَأَقْبَلَ It's for a person to start from the nape of the neck and move to the hairline. Because he's going to the qubul, the front. Or And then going from the front back to the nape. That's the dubur, the back. Most people, when they make wudu, or many people, they do the exact opposite. And that is the second interpretation of aqbala wa adbara, which is to start at the, foreline, at the hairline and go to the nape and then back to the hairline. And that's a very long discussion with regards to the Arabic language and the narrations. The people of knowledge, they say that both ways and in other ways as well are optional. And it's a very long discussion among the people of knowledge with regards to the head and what has to be wiped on one's head. The entire head, a part of the head, half of the head, a third of the head, one finger, two fingers. It's a very long discussion among the traditional schools of thought. It says, Marratan wahidatan, one time, not twice, not three times. And that is uh, an issue that is mentioned in other narrations that the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, it was quoted to have wiped his head more than once. And the people of knowledge, they differ on that as well. With regards, first and foremost, to the authenticity of those hadith, let alone the actual fiqh rulings. And many of the people of knowledge, they say that wiping the head in these narrations is a mistake. They say, shadha, it's a hadith munkar, is that it's wrong and it's ever, it's not authentic at all. It's weak and it goes against that which is authentic. That the Prophet والسلام, only did it one time. The hadith in the Sunan of Imam Abi Dawood, reported by some companions such as uh, Rubayyah bint Mu'awad, 
uh, that the Prophet said him he wiped his head more than once. And there are other narrations as well. Khairan, inshallah. This one in Sahihain says one time. Some of the people of knowledge, they say, from the wisdoms of only wiping the head once, is that if the person wipes it twice or three times, it will be as if they're washing one's head. And the head is supposed to be wiped and not washed. ثُمَّ قَصْرَ رِجْلَيْهِ إِلَى الْكَعْبَيْنِ Then he washed his rijlain, his two feet, to the ka'bain, his two ankles, the balls of his ankles. In other words, he wasn't wearing socks, leather socks, khufain. He wasn't wearing sandals, not lane, or shoes. But he was bare, uh, he had bare feet or barefooted, and he washed his feet. He didn't wipe his feet. He washed them, it says. Ghasala, he washed his feet. And that's a very long discussion uh, with regards to some of the, excuse me, misguided sex from among the Muslims and from among those who have left the fold of Islam who claim and call themselves to be Muslims regarding wiping the feet and not washing the feet. The sunnah of the Prophet wasallam clearly reported here and the authentic sources is that the feet were not wiped unless he was wearing something. And if his feet were bare, he washed them. He washed them. Khayr and that's a very, very long discussion with regards to wiping the feet, wiping over the khufain, taking off the socks, and the list goes on. Khayr and inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So uh, that's the general explanation of this hadith. And there are several for why that we take from this hadith. First benefit is... That it was from the way of the Salaf al-Salih, the Sahaba, and the Tabi'een to ask questions and to seek fiqh and to ask the people of knowledge. It says, Su'ila, he was asked. Who asked him, a Sahabi or Tabi'i, in whose presence they asked him. So no one can come along and say that you can't ask a question or you shouldn't ask a question. The Sunnah is not to ask a question. The way of the Salaf, the Minhaj of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah is not to ask questions. Just be quiet, just observe, don't ask any questions. Okay, that is not absolutely correct. And if you read a narration in which someone said, don't ask, asking questions is not from the way of the Sunnah, it's a means of fitna, that you shouldn't ask fit questions. The Prophet said, never did this, he never allowed this, and he disliked questions, so on and so forth. Then we say, if it's coming from the Prophet وسلم, that he disliked questions, then it is not to be understood absolutely. Whereas a hadith that says that the Prophet disliked questions or disliked things like this, excessive questioning, we have other hadith in which the Prophet وسلم, clearly answered questions. And he encouraged the people to ask him questions and he allowed it. Tayyip. As far as it was other than the Prophet وسلم, saying that, then his statement is not a hujjah. His statement is not a hujjah, it's not a legal proof in Islam. And according to those who say that a companion statement is a hujjah, with the well-known details, then it also is restricted and is not absolute. If Ibn Abbas or Sufyan Thawri or Imam Ahmed or this one or that one said, don't ask a question, then we have other instances in which there were books in which Imam Ahmed answered questions. And it's very sad that we find some immature students of knowledge saying this and promoting this. Why is he answering questions? Why are you answering questions? Don't ask questions. Imam Ahmed said this. Imam Ahmed said, I'm afraid of fame. Imam Ahmed said, I'm scared to answer a question. I'm scared for the people to think that I have knowledge and so on and so forth. And he used these statements as if they're from the Prophet Sallallahu And if they were, then they can be restricted and understood, as we explained. And if they aren't, then have you not read the books of Imam Ahmed, Masail? The books in which... His son, his sons, they reported, they asked him hundreds of questions, literally hundreds, from everything from wudu to inheritance. Ishaq ibn Rahawai. They have masail. So this is unfortunate by many students of knowledge. And some people, they say, well, Akhi, you should take it easy on the brothers. Take it easy on the students of knowledge. They try their best. They do what they can. They spread the knowledge that they have. Jazakallah khairan. Those brothers who went overseas for a short period of time or in a certain period of time in which things were unknown, things were the science of, of da'wah and of, of knowledge. They weren't as refined and sophisticated as today. And whatever time a person went in the 80s or the 90s, so on and so forth, the 70s, jazakallah khairan. 
May Allah bless you and reward you for the knowledge you've spread. However, it's a new day. It's a new time. It's a new era. And if you fail to update your system, then your system is obsolete. And there's knowledge and books and things that are available, let alone, quote unquote, mental athleticism. The athletes of today, not like the athletes of the past. It's different. It's a different time. So if you fail to update and renew and refresh, then you must move out of the way and step to the side and allow those people who do have the proper knowledge, who did study for many, many more years than you have, to teach the people the proper and the correct manner. And if you have limited knowledge, if you only went to Medina, you studied in the language program and you left, you dropped out of the college for one reason or another, may Allah have mercy on you, your father passed, your mother passed, your wife, whatever the case may be, things happen, no doubt. That's fine. Jazakallah khairan for the knowledge you spread. But don't speak on things that you don't know and understand thoroughly and properly. And secondly, do not prevent and hinder those who do. Those who have studied for four or five more, more times uh, than you have. Who have completed and finished things. Okay? Don't prevent them. Don't hinder them from teaching the people. If you yourself cannot teach the people properly. And the knowledge is required in two years in Medina or a year and a half in Egypt, or two years in Yemen, or wherever you want to study, that's fine. But do not go beyond that knowledge. Do not speak beyond what you know. And this is extremely important and very dangerous. And only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows how many people have been misled, how many communities have been miseducated because of this. وَلَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوْتَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ خَيْرًا إِنشَاءَ So we benefit the permissibility or the recommendation, or not even that, because it's not the Prophet, we benefit from the way of the Sahaba and the Tabi'in is to ask the learned people. Another benefit we take from this hadith is the recommendation of teaching people through actions. And we also take from this hadith how the Sahaba were trustworthy and they did not doubt him. Whereas they asked the Prophet wudu, and he made wudu himself. So they believed him, they honored his integrity, and they also respected his accuracy, that he would do something physically that he actually remembered from the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Khayran inshallah. Moving on to the next hadith. Chapter number 8. The author says, Babu al-Itari fil istinthari wal istijmal. He says, al-Itar. Making istinthar and istijmar in an odd Number, an odd number, once, three times, five times, seven times, nine, etc. Making these two things, istinthar and istijmar, making them witr, like the prayer that you make at night, a witr prayer, and not even but odd. So therefore, the first term is al-istinthar. Um, we've mentioned that already with regards to the nose. With regards to the nose. And secondly, al-istijmar, which basically means cleansing oneself after relieving oneself. Using the bathroom, the washroom. Some people even say answering the call of nature. Allahu alam about that. If you can say that, what's the call of nature? What's important is when a person... Uh, uses the restroom or the outhouse, wherever you, wherever you go, when you remove these things from your body, you have to clean yourself. And the manner of how you're supposed to clean yourself should be done in an odd number. And the word istijmar could mean a person cleaning him or herself with stones, small stones. And the word istijmar could also be al istinja with water. Or al-istinja and istijmar could sometimes be synonymous. And some ulama call it al-istitaba. What's important is that when a person relieves him or herself from uh, stool, from excrement, or as they say at number two, then the person should use clean, dry matter no less than three times. And we'll get into some other details with regards to... Uh, the conditions of this and the khilaf of the ulama regarding it. Tayyip. Hadith number 137. 
اسناد الحديث هو ابي هريره رضي الله عنه عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم انه قال من توضا فليستنثر ومن استجمر فليوتر حديث ابي هريره رضي الله عنه عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم انه قال اذا استيقظ احدكم من منامه فتوضا فليستنثر ثلاثا فان الشيطان يبيت على خيشمه حديث 137 says narrated Abu Huraira رضي الله عنه that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم says anyone who makes wudu should make istinthar and anyone who makes istijmar should do it witter with an odd number of times hadith 138 is narrated by Abu Huraira رضي الله عنه the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said when one wakes up and he makes wudu, he should make istinthar three times. Put the water in and out of his nose thrice. Because the devil sleeps upon his nostrils or sleeps in or on his nostrils. Both of these hadiths, they teach us and they explain and instruct us to do things that are mentioned in the chapter heading of istinthar and istijmar. Uh, hadith number 137 is the hadith that mentions the witr. Uh, it does not mention for, is for istinthar to be done in a witr amount, nor does hadith number 138 uh, mention about witr, but it says three times. There are other narrations which have more explicit details. These here are as they state, which we've ex previously explained with regards to the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim. And the chapter heading is coming from outside of this book, from Sahih Muslim, the Sharh of Sahih Muslim. And other narrations may have things that are not mentioned in the Hadith in Bukhari and Muslim. But the chapter headings are borrowed from the Sharh of Sahih Muslim. We explained that many, many times before. And how many times there's no mutabaka or no direct mutabaka between the Hadith and between the Unwan of the Bab. We've explained that many times before. Khayran, inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Moving forward. Uh, hadith Abi Huraira says, Man tawadda'a fal yastanthir. Anyone who makes wudu, she make istinthar. This hadith proves, the zahir of this hadith proves, is that it is mandatory to make istinthar. Obligatory to put the water in and out of the nose. To... Exhale the water, a person had to have inhaled the water. Okay, so that's a lazim. Then it also shows woman istajmara. It shows the obligation of making istajmar in a witr amount as well, three times, etc. It does not state that istajmar is mandatory in this narration, uh, nor does it state that wudu is mandatory, but it states. When you make wudu, make istinthar. When you make istijmar, make sure that it's witr. It should be done in an odd number of times. Khayran, inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The other narrations uh, outside of the Sahihain, outside of Sahih Muslim, have more details. And that's the issue of khilaf among the people of knowledge with regards to when a person makes istijmar, what are the conditions of it? Does it have to be at least three times or three stones, three clean wipings? And it's a condition of inqa, is that it has to be clean, thoroughly cleaned. And if you use three stones or three wipings and it's, you're still not thoroughly clean, then you have to do more, but it has to be withered as well. Just khilaf on those issues. Does it have to be, less, can it be less than three? Does it have to be five? Etc. Now, which we've explained in Bulug al Maram. Here, the hadith that we have teaches us when you make istijmar, it should be witr. And the other narrations teach us that it should be no less than three. No less than three. So, if it's no less than three, based off of other narrations outside of the Sahihain, hadith of Salman and Sahih Muslim and others, and it has to be witr based off of this narration. Then it proves there's no less than three, and the next level is five. Khayran, inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From the issues that pertain to this hadith, 
especially in the modern times, is when a person cleans himself in the bathroom. Does a person have to use stones? Or is it permissible to use toilet tissue? Or baby wipe? Or sanitary wipe? Or a wet wipe? Or whatever the case may be. Can a person just use water? Or can a person just use tissue and no water at all? Uh, these are all issues that are well known to the people of knowledge in the books of fiqh. Uh, obviously, the Prophet, والسلام, he addressed the people and he spoke to them in countless hadith based off of what they knew, based off of what they had, what was available. We've explained this, the concept of water, okay, uh, and many other things. And it does not necessarily mean that it has to be a stone. Obviously, there's a lot of contradiction among many people with regards to something that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, and they said that it has to be of that thing, but other issues, and they say it doesn't have to be of that thing, such as this. Uh, the other hadith teach us that it should be stones, stones, ahajar. If the Prophet doesn't mention paper or tissue, in which they had mendil, there was a mendil, there was a, 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 some type of uh, napkin or, or some type of towel. They had these things in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi as is mentioned in some hadith. Maimuna gave the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam a napkin, a towel, a mendil, after he made ghusl and he refused to use it. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says stones. And they say, no, you can use tissue, you can use baby wipes. But when it comes to the zakat al-fitr, they say, no, it has to be food. And it cannot be money. Why? Because the Prophet Sallallahu clearly said, sa'an min kadha. Everybody understand this? So we're not here to discuss the issue of zakat al-fitr in detail. What we're here to do right now is to make the point of their things which the Prophet Sallallahu addressed the people to do, not necessarily meaning that the thing itself was meant, but it was the, the process itself that was meant. Clean yourself, whether it's a stone, which is easy, cheap, free, available in every place in Saudi Arabia. Uh, yeah, there was no Saudi Arabia back then. Obviously, we're talking about now, the location, for those who don't know too much about yeah, I mean, the history of geography, things like this, Arabia, the Hijaz, the Prophet was in Medina. He left Mecca. So in the city of Medina and Mecca, Okay, we're talking over a thousand years ago. Was there a place that you go that it wasn't a stone or a rock? So he spoke to them with that which is simple, easy, and uh, easily accessed. And it wasn't something that he was necessarily speaking to that you had to use. But it had to be a stone. Okay? And the hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ told the companions not to use other things, not to use other pieces of matter, which proves that it's not restricted to a stone. So if a person uses a stone or tree bark, or a leaf. If a person uses a tissue and all of these things, then the ulama and the fuqaha, they say there's nothing wrong with that. And that's a very important principle with regards to the statement that Islam is applicable to every time and to every place. We as Muslims know that this is an absolutely true statement. One way or another, whether it's everything from the sharia, certain issues of the sharia, let alone the creed of Islam. Okay? Uh, but... If someone sat you down and asked you and says, how is this applicable? Your dean says, use a rock to clean your behind. The most sensitive part of your body, one of the most yeah, any sacred parts of your body, you're going to use a stone, which may have sharp edges, rough edges, dirt, okay, uh, bacteria, germs, etc. What is this? So every time you go somewhere in the bathroom, you have to carry three rocks in your pocket. And what do you do with the rocks when you finish with them? Do you flush them? He put him in it. What, what happens? We say that the Prophet Sallallahu he didn't intend for us to restrict ourselves to certain things. Rather, he wanted us to clean ourselves with that which wasn't sacred, that which was clean, that which wasn't food, that which wasn't a means of someone else's benefit and outfitting. So tissue or anything else that's clean, that's not sacred, that isn't food, it can be used. So Islam is applicable and the Prophet Sallam, in other words, in simple terms, he's telling us, when you use the bathroom, when you have a bowel movement, make sure you wash your behinds, period. Clean your behinds. Make sure that you're clean, physically and spiritually, inwardly and outwardly. That's what he's saying to us. If it's a stone, if it's paper, or anything else that is not food, that is not sacred, using something which is sacred from a book and things like this. So, and this can be applied to any other issue of Islam. 
and in other things which are clearly spiritual, ta'abudi, and which we are to do it three times and not say, oh, it's the modern era, let's just do it two times. No, that's different. But actual matter is different than uh, something, a spiritual number or spiritual way of doing it. Naam? And there are many other things, many other issues. That's an entire lecture in itself. And many people who speak on the modern issues of Islam and the Sharia, they crash when they get into this. Uh, the Hadith of 137 teaches us that it's mandatory to make istinthar. It's mandatory. And it's the view of only some of the ulama, a few of the ulama, uh, and the other ulama, they say that it's just recommended. This Hadith in Sahihain clearly proves that it's fart, it's mandatory, whereas it's a command. The Prophet commanded. Uh, and it's a long discussion with regards to this command and the issue of it being mandatory or just recommended. Khairan, inshallah. Hadith number 138, uh, when you wake up and make the wudu, make sure you inhale and exhale the water because the shaitan sleeps upon one's nostrils, one's nose. In other words, two main interpretations of this hadith. The first is, is that it's al haqiqah it's literal, it's as it is, and that the nose is one of the entrances to the inside of one's body, to the brain. The mind. And they say, some of the people knowledge, they say that the nose is one of the only parts of the body that doesn't have a, one of the only openings to the internal part of one's body that doesn't have a covering in which there's no type of closure. The eyes can be closed. Uh, other parts, one's private parts can be closed. Uh, the ears in which uh, there's a closure. Things cannot get in uh, inside of the innermost part of the ear. But the nose is directly open. And others, they say, that what's meant by the shaitan is on his nostrils or in his nostrils is that there's uh, dust and dirt, mucus and snot and things like this, which are dirty and looked down upon, which uh, agree with the nature of shaitan. We know that we stick with the zahir until there's a necessary need for the goal to other than the zahir. Even though the word zahir has a broad meaning in the Arabic language. And there are many things in the Arabic language which are still zahir. That's a very, very long discussion. Uh, the hadith clearly proves the affirmation of the shaitan. And it affirms that he has a physical presence and an effect upon man. And the hadith also shows us, I would say subtly, uh, the impermissibility of many things that people smoke and sniff and inhale and snort. I don't think there's anyone who's mentioned this and took this benefit from this hadith before me. Alhamdulillah. No pride in that. All praises for Allah. The concept of the nostril and what the ulama say that it leads directly to the dimaq, the brain. We know today many people, they smell things where there's paint or paint thinner, or glue, or whether it's cocaine, crack cocaine, marijuana, and things like this, uh, but specifically not smoke, but something that a person inhales and snorts and smells, in which the fumes go to the brain, and even upon smoke, when a person smokes certain things, and it goes to the brain, and how quick and how fast it reaches the brain, causes intoxication, and causes permanent an irreparable damage to one's brain. So the hadith says, when you make wudu, after waking up, wash your nostrils. In other words, keep your nose clean. Keep your brain pure. And do not allow these things to get to your brain. So if the shaitan is on a person's nostrils at the time of sleep, and this believer could have slept, reciting ayatul kursi, Sayyidul Istighfar, reading the Quls, uh, reciting the Qur'an. He's a pious believer, and the, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu says that the shaitan is on the person's nostrils. Then what is the case with someone who smokes or snorts something? Where was the shaitan? Where would the shaitan be then? And these fumes are going directly to a person's brain. So this is a very, very, very subtle but important benefit with regards to the nose and with regards to the brain. And only Allah knows the Prophet said him, he spoke of things over a thousand years ago. And it's not for us to 
look at things in a crude manner. And this man who received this great Qur'an, who received these great, uh, uh, this great inspiration to say these hadiths, that he just spoke on everything based off of face value, and his words were limited and restricted to certain things. That's unbefitting of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. Okay? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely knows best. Allah knew that which would take place and that which would happen in the future. So this hadith teaches us a precept, and that is to keep one's brain pure. So anything that causes intoxication to the brain, that changes your brain, anything that makes your brain release dopamine, or dopamine, huh? as they say, it causes dopeness in your brain, then the Muslim has to ask himself, what is it? What am I watching? What am I listening to? What am I drinking and eating? And it causes my brain to release these chemicals and cause me to behave in this manner, and they form habits and addiction. Very serious and important issue. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely knows best. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.